There is a lot of preparation that goes into an open boat journey, or any boat trip for that matter. Wooden boats in particular require continuous maintenance to ensure that they're seaworthy and watertight. Timber moves constantly in response to its surroundings. The fibres in the wood take up moisture from the atmosphere when it is humid or when they're immersed. When out of the water, the moisture is given up to the atmosphere until the wood reaches equilibrium. With each cycle in the weather, or launching and retrieval, the moisture content of the wood is changing and it's moving in all its dimensions. It doesn't move much in length generally, but it moves in width and thickness at different rates depending on how the boards are cut. It moves more across the growth rings than it does from inside to the outer growth rings. It's this difference in movement that sets up stresses that cause timber to warp and crack. And it is the very clever thing that the Nords knew about wood and how to work with it rather than against it to create very seaworthy craft that were watertight and capable of crossing oceans to conquer new territory. The place where the planks overlap in a clinker boat are called the lands. They're not glued, but they're clenched together, usually with copper nails roved on the inside. When clinker boats dry out, the lands are not firmly seated together, so the boats can leak quite a lot. Once the boat is back in the water, the wood swells after a little while, placing pressure on the lands and preventing leaks. The wood I used in Moonlight is hue and pine, an ancient species found in the southwest of Tasmania. During the 80s, hydroelectric development in this pristine wilderness area meant that large swathes of rainforest were placed underwater. Substantial amounts of hue and pine and of some other precious species were recovered from the flooded forests, and some has been preserved for the continuation of the Tasmanian boat building tradition. Hue and pine matures over a period of two to three thousand years, and being slow grown, it is of a very fine texture and beautiful to work. It's very stable and prized boat building timber. If you strip away all the window dressing, a boat at its most basic level is a vessel for transporting people and goods across a body of water by either motor, sails or oars. But a boat is much more than that. A boat is a very suitable vessel for forming character and making better human beings of us. Boating often causes a surge of emotions of one kind or another. You only need to experience an unexpected jibe or watch the antics on a launching ramp to get that. I experience that every time I fire up the little inboard and putter across a glassy sea or pull out the oars to a pleasing clatter and explore a riverbank or when I raise the gunter rig to the tune of its friendly creaks and groans and take on whatever wind and sea state the day holds for me. Connecting with nature on an emotional level is incredibly hard to fathom but I do know that there is a deeper discovery of who I am every time I set out on another adventure. Authenticity is in short supply amongst some online communities, but that is one thing that I find refreshing about those of us who love to mess around in boats. People who've had their characters tested and proven by the elements seem to find it easier to remain true to their own personality, spirit and character. One reason our boats become very personal to us is that as we've navigated the peaks and the troughs of our lives, our boats have provided us with a wonderful place to contemplate, grow and even deal with our pain. I'm going to share some thoughts on who I am rather than what I do. I can't avoid the matter of core beliefs and I recognise that for each of us our very diverse beliefs are both deeply personal and vitally important. Some of you are friends I've known for a long time Others I've connected with and had some meaningful conversations with you via online platforms. But for the majority of you, I enjoy little more than the knowledge that we all enjoy doing stuff in boats at some level. If this conversation isn't for you, I respect that and encourage you to fast forward to the section where I discuss my experimentation with camping on board Moonlight. I would appreciate your ideas and experiences on that subject. You'll find the bookmark in the description below that skips this next bit and takes you directly there. 
I built Moonlight with the help of my wife on the banks of Lake Crevallon in northern Tasmania. She was launched in September of 1981. I had built a series of kayaks in my early teens, but this was the biggest project that I'd taken on at that point. There was a lot to learn, especially when it came to steaming the first three strakes in place. In her first decade, we went on some memorable journeys around Tasmania's coast, including the Frasnay Peninsula, and Cradle Mountain Lake St Clair National Park in the Highlands. One of those trips, with two of my close friends, included about 10 toddlers. We were fearless in those days. There is something compelling about the shapes and textures of the bits and pieces old wooden boats are made up of. This rig is 80 years old, having been taken from the original boat built by John Philp that Moonlight was based on. It is likely that the timber that I used in Moonlight predates the birth of Christ. Sometimes I call her the Jesus boat. The Sea of Galilee is about 10 miles across and 15 miles from north to south. There's an ancient story about the disciples, some of whom were fishermen, were in the middle of the Sea of Galilee in a strong blow. It was the middle of the night and they were in serious trouble, rowing hard and struggling against the wind and the waves. Most people will have heard of the miracle of Jesus walking on the water, and this is that very story. Jesus got into the boat, and the story goes that immediately the wind died down, and they arrived at their destination, which was Capernaum, on the north shore of the lake. There have been times in my life when I've carried burdens too heavy for a mere mortal, and I've become very weary of rowing against the wind and the waves. I often find myself wrestling in my own strength, and sometimes losing heart, then I remember this ancient wisdom, much older than the timber moonlight is crafted from, and I have learned to stop struggling. I've learned to pause and reflect, sometimes for a long time. This is the meaning of the word contemplation, and there is not enough time made for it in our busy and driven lives.
I've been experimenting with setting up moonlight so that I can sleep on board. I took the fly sheet off my tent and set up the bows across the gunnels. It worked out pretty well, giving me more headroom than would have been achieved with just a boom tent. This is an issue with such a small boat. It provided enough space to prepare a bed and a meal. I'm thinking about making some bed boards on the starboard side to get up to the level of the centre case so that I don't have to wake up in the shape of a pretzel. Regardless of the contortions that I went through to get a night's sleep while spooning with my inboard motor, first light was a delight to behold. The inky black waters are caused by tannins that leach out of the surrounding wetlands. I think with a few minor adjustments I could make this cover work. The bows from the tent work extremely well, but I need to get the skirt of the fly sheet outside of the boat and some tie downs to keep the water out. Fortunately, it didn't rain on this occasion, but it's not uncommon to get four inches in a single burst in this part of southeast Queensland. It doesn't take long to pack down everything and untie from shore and get underway. This time I'm rowing the last section where motors are not permitted on this river. Shortcomings in the rowing setup emerge pretty quickly, and I'm thinking about the best way to set things up so that I can row more efficiently in the future. I find few things in life to match the contemplative experience of just sitting and watching beautiful wooden boats placed in a surreal and beautiful composition of nature at its very best. Although this will never come even close to walking on a path by the Mirrored Noosa River in the evening with my toddler granddaughter hanging onto my finger, singing a little song and chatting in a way in a language that I don't fully understand and watching the boats bobbing up and down on the river at the same time. Walk, come walk with me Feel the breeze, come walk with me Oh and dance, come dance with me Shout for your feet, come dance with me And I will tell you when you're older How I loved you just the same It only matters where we're going It never mattered from where you came Gets you down, steals your crown, and breaks your will. Oh, well, I, I'll pick you up, brush off the dust, and hold you still. I will tell you when you're older how I loved you just the same. It only matters where we're going It never mattered from where you came And go to sleep, my darling Oh, the night is getting darker You can dream about tomorrow tell you when you're older how I loved you just the same it doesn't matter where you're coming from all that matters is where you're going but it's not quite that simple because the journey also counts for a lot we can't change the past but we can make sure that the final destination will have been worth the struggle depending on the decisions that we make along the way it has been said that I can't change the direction of the wind, but I can adjust my sails to always reach my destination. Nothing demonstrates this better than the AC-75 America's Cup Challenge that at the time of writing is being played out with great drama on Auckland Harbour. The boats are able to sail up to four times the wind speed by adjusting their super high-tech sails 
with precision and skill. They're able to sail at 32 knots in just 8 knots of wind once they get up on their foils. As sailors, we trim our sails to make the most of the wind, no matter whether it presents as a gentle whisper or as a howling, roaring forties gale. I easily forget just how pleasant and fulfilling the journey can be when I remember that I have Jesus in the boat with me. He is like the wind in my sails, filling me with confidence that the destination is worth the trials of the journey. Sometimes it takes a storm or two to get back into that very special place where I have confidence beyond human understanding that the destination is worth the frustration of the doldrums and the testing times of the storms. I've learned to appreciate and grow through both, especially the storms. <laughs>